We are continuing in the book of Revelation in chapter 11. At present, we're dealing with the two prophets. Uh, I'm going to continue. Um, I'm going to start in Revelation chapter 1, verse 1, and then I'm going to read up to where we left off, and then we're going to continue from this point forward. Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. And there was a reed given me, and there was given me a reed like unto a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And these are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelleth on the earth. All right, so we're gonna continue with the last verse, verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. So we see that all peoples, all kindreds, all tongues and things like that uh, were rejoicing over the death of these prophets. So there's going to come a point in time where the whole world is going to turn against God, turn against Christ, turn against the people of God, turn against Israel. There will be no people that have any kind of cause right now. People may say, well, Republicans support uh, Israel or something like that. Uh, and um, uh, the nation of Israel or, or other nations, they are pro, pro-God, pro pro-Christian, things like that. Whether it be some of the European nations, they say Britain. or, or there, uh, There's going to come a point in time where all people, no matter what causes they are for, and all nations will be against God and against Christ. There will be nothing or anyone, uh, any movement or anything that is pro-God, pro-Christ, uh, pro-Israel, uh, right? And so uh, here's the, the only time that we see rejoicing um, in the book of Revelation by the world, that is, is when the death of the two prophets occur. That's what brings rejoicing in the world is the death of two prophets that preach the gospel, right? That's the only time that you see rejoicing occurring um, in the world is when the two prophets were killed. So it just shows just how bad things are and the mindset and the wickedness and the, and the, uh, the darkness that's in the hearts of mankind that's living on the earth. So the two prophets, they tormented them. They were tormented um, because the people don't want to hear the word of God. The word of God caused torment to people. The hearing of the word of God, the preaching of the word of God, just the lifestyle um, uh, that these two prophets lived in Christ was a torment to them. To see people living like that, looking like that. Be, I mean, people won't want to, if people, you know, we went out to eat breakfast early this morning and we prayed or whatever for our breakfast. There are people that will see something like that and be angry and upset. We're going to get to a place like that where they don't want to see it. They want to see people living for Christ, speaking about Christ, or living for God or anything like that. They will be upset. That's a torment to them, right? That's anguish to see that, right? Um, these individuals cause torment to them because they preach justice. 
right? And they preached against sin. And that's what the world doesn't want to see. When the time is coming where they won't be able to tolerate, the world won't be able to tolerate that anymore. And they also prophesied of the coming of Christ and judgment day. The world doesn't want to hear anything about the coming of Christ. They don't want to hear anything about the judgment day or the day of judgment that's, that's coming, right? And of course, these two prophets also executed judgments against them, right? The Bible says that uh, if anyone tried to hurt them, which is important, that means that these men were actually hurt. People did not want to hear the gospel, did not want um, them preaching the judgment to come, the coming of Christ. And so these people tried to harm and hurt them, right? And so because they were harmed or hurt, then the, the, the scripture says that if any tried to hurt them, then this is how that they would execute judgment with uh, fire, all plagues and droughts, etc. So, and I believe that they did execute these plagues and fires and things like that and withholding the rain and things like that because as they preached the gospel, people tried to hurt and harm them, kill them, stab them, burn them, right? We saw the, we know that the prophets of old were Saul asunder, right? At the preaching of Christ, preaching of the gospel, bringing the judgments of God for the, against sin, right? Peter was killed. All of the apostles were killed, right? Uh, so people want to hurt those that preach the gospel. That's the darkness, our darkness that's approaching. And because they preached and they were hurt, right? They were hurt. The scripture says they didn't die, but they were hurt. <laughs> you know, they were shot, you know, stabbed or whatever. It doesn't really say how they were hurt, but it says if, if when they were hurt, if anyone should hurt them, that they would be able to proclaim judgments against them, against them right? So they were hurt and harmed. Uh, but because the result of that, though, they executed all kinds of judgments of fire, plagues and droughts and things like that. And that tormented them as well. As they tried as they hurt them, then they were inflicted uh, with these judgments. Right. And so that's what the torment was there. One of the, the major torment, though, was that they were preaching that the payment for sin is coming. Right. They don't want you to preach against the judgment of sin is coming. Uh, and I'm using an example of that the torment that is caused. Um, is associated with uh, preaching that the payment for sin or judgment for sin is coming. When you look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 32 through 34, we know the story about a man who owed a lot to, I don't know, it was like a king or something or whatever, and the king forgave him. Right. And then the servant went out and there was someone else who owed him a lot too, and he wouldn't forgive him. And that's the account we're reading here in Matthew chapter 18, verse 32. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Should not thou also have compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors, so he should pay all that he all that was due unto him. So the torment, tormenting is a result of having to pay the penalty for your sins, right? That's what tormented them, that what these um, prophets were doing were preaching justice, preaching judgment, uh, preaching the, judge, the day of judgment was coming and, I, and punishing them for their sins, right? Punishing them, that they, they were paying for their sins and they were punishing them with, with all these things. And so that was bringing torment to them that they were actually having being, uh, all the judgments were being poured out and they were having to pay for their sins, especially when they tried to hurt them or harm them. And that just created torment uh, for them, right? So that's what they saw these men as, as tormentors, uh, as they were rendering judgments and executions of them for their sins, right? It goes on, verse 11 says, and after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. So again, we see here three and a half, oh, I left a three and a half days. Right. So here again, this is basically the uh, dear, the day year principle or year for day principle. We talked about more about the three and a half days uh, previously, but all right. So for each, um, uh, so each each day represent um, a year, right? So they they preach for three and a half years. So their bodies lay in the streets for three and a half days. So here again, you see this this principle of the day year principle, or a year for a day or a day for a year. So they're lying in that um, on, in their streets, representing the time of their ministry, right? Signifying the beginning. All right, it marked the 
um, the time of their preaching and mark the end of their preaching, that they had fulfilled their ministries. Basically what it's saying, the three and a half days represent the fulfillment of the three and a half years of their ministry. It just It kind of marked the end of it. But at the same time, though, it signified a new beginning for believers after the completion of, of the Great Tribulation. So after those prophets were killed, it marked the completion of the purpose of what they had been called to do, turn uh, Israel back to Christ, back to the Messiah, turn them to God, but also ex begin to execute the judgments uh, that God had planned for mankind, but also to deliver the gospel as well. But then that meant that once they were killed, it signified then that, all right, they don't want to hear the gospel anymore. Right? They've completely silenced the gospel, don't have anything to do with the gospel anymore. So it signified um, uh, uh, basically the end of, of salvation or the hearing the message. Um, of course, we know they thought they were basically sciencing, but we know that God's going to send angels who's going to continue to preach the gospel as well. So again, that just shows you how much God loves mankind. Right? He's not willing that any should perish. So if anybody goes to hell, right, even before the great tribulation period, it's like people that die without Christ, it is not without. We see how much God is willing to do it uh, to those that are the most wicked here on earth that God goes through and Christ goes through every means necessary to try to draw those to Christ, right? Even before the great tribulation, in the time that we're living in right now, and even before this, the, the church age, even in the Old Testament, those that were living, God does not want, he loves all of mankind. He does not want any to perish. He goes through great extremes to reach them. And we know that because we see the great extremes he's doing now. But even before this occurred, God has always reached out to, do, to show himself, to draw man unto him, right? Uh, we may not fully understand it and be able to see it, but trust me, no one leaves this earth without God going through the same extent, without Christ going through the same extent, uh, extent of the Son of God to draw men unto him, that they may know who God is, that they may receive life, right? That they may have fellowship with him in eternity. He does not leave anyone without that opportunity. And they could be in Africa or whatever people like to say, in the Amazon or whatever. God does not just allow people to just die without knowing him and end up in the lake of fire. And we see that played out here in the book of Revelation. Right, so anyway, it says, uh, um, the spirit of life from God entered into them. Right, so those that do the will of God in Christ have eternal life and they will always experience the resurrection that comes with serving God and living in him. So all of these, these prophets, two prophets were killed and their bodies lay in the street for three and a half days. Right, the Bible says here that the spirit of life from God entered into them. Right, so they still have eternal life. So you can kill the body, but you can't kill the soul and you can't take away eternal life. And so here they, we see this, this experience of, of a resurrection occurring. So the scripture says, uh, they stood on their feet. So that's showing a symbol of victory, a symbol of overcoming, right? Of uh, them being on the solid foundation uh, of God in Christ Jesus. So they're able to stand up and to rise. So we can never be uh, defeated. In, in the natural realm, it may appear to be so, but in the spiritual realm, in the spiritual world, right? We have eternal life. So. Uh, and that's what, that's what we're seeing here. All right. Um, so the world has no victory over the people of God. No matter what it looks like, the world never has victory over the people of God. It's not possible for those that, he, that have um, uh, eternal life in Christ. All right. It says, great fear fell upon them that saw them. All right. So the very presence of these righteous men rising up again caused fear and torment. Right. So when they saw them, great fear fell upon them that saw them. Right. Because these these two prophets here have been tormenting them and torturing them. And then to see them stand up and rise again just brought just madness uh, and great despair and fear of like uh, fear, of course, that they were able to rise up after three and a half days. But also it's like, oh, my God, you know, are they going to continue to uh, to torture us? The very presence of these righteous men again. Uh, cause fear to come upon them like, oh my God, we're going to be tortured. We're going to be tormented again, right? They're concerned about the torment, the hearing of the gospel and the judgments that are continued to come upon them. They just caused great fear when they saw them, right? Trust me, this is not a fear that is a fear that's associated with, oh, I'm going to give reverence to God. You know, oh, I'm going to give my life to Christ now because I've seen these men. This is not that kind of fear 
uh, that they're talking about here. These are men that are tormented. And when these men rise up on their feet and show that they've overcome, been victorious, there, there's a fear now of just like, oh my God, no, not more. You know, they're going to continue to torture us and punish us. Right? Uh, verse 12 it says, And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up, up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld him. So they are still their enemies. The people that saw these prophets rise up and ascend up in a cloud, they were still their enemy. That's why I'm saying, you know, this fear that they were having wasn't that it was out of like, oh, my God, look, this miracle that has happened. Oh, now I'm going to believe on God. I'm going to believe on the preaching of the gospel. Uh, they were still their enemies. They What they feared was that, oh, my God, more torment, more torture, more preaching of the gospel, you know, uh, things like that. But they heard a voice from heaven. Right, the day that they're talking about here um, is the earth dwellers. They heard the voice from heaven. They really heard the proclamation of the voice saying unto them, come up hither, right? Um, and But the, the the them that they're referring to, of course, is the two prophets. So the earth dwellers heard a great voice speaking unto the two prophets, but they were able to hear what was spoken to the two prophets. And what was spoken to them was the come up hither, Right, so here what we're seeing is a type of resurrection that's occurring, right? So although their earthly bodies had been killed, right, um, the father and the son are saying, we're not going to allow even their bodies to remain in Babylon like that in the streets, right? These righteous men will not be left alone on the streets uh, in Sodom and Egypt like that. We will not allow their body to remain like that. So they were called up, right? Um to have fellowship uh, with God and with the saints and, and, and with Christ called up to heaven. And it says here that um, they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. So this is kind of like, you know, we know cloud is a, is a, is a loaded phrase that has lots of different meanings spiritually. And so I'm also wondering that it says when they were called up to heaven in a cloud, I'm wondering if that cloud of what they're talking about here is possibly, could it be, uh, that they were changed into their glorified spiritual bodies and received up into heaven, right? That as a part of their being changed, boom, um, that they took on, because we know that you can't go to heaven in a, you can't go to heaven in your natural body. There has to be a change, right? So I'm wondering, like, you know, this says they ascended up to heaven in a cloud. That was that what John is seeing is that how they're, they were changed and called up. And they were glorified, put on a glorified spiritual body, which has the appearance of a cloud and is just rising up, right? But also could it be that they were received up by Jesus, right? Um, and that's the cloud that they were received up to, like being received by Christ, right? Uh, being, you know, like that. I'm not really sure, but uh, I'm warning if more of the first thing that they were changed uh, into their glorified spiritual bodies and they were heavenly appearing, uh, you know, had the glory of God upon them uh, as they were ascending up into heaven. That's what they were seeing, like they've been glorified, you know, like a, like a resurrection, which is different than the resurrection that the church experiences. What the, by, what the bride of Christ experiences is that it's, it's in a, in a moment, in a, what do you call it? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's like, boom, before you can even know it, we're just, we're caught up out of here so quick to quickly escape uh, the judgments and the darkness that's coming upon the earth. We don't even get to experience the the depth of Satan and the Antichrist spirit and the destruction that's coming upon the world. Uh, but however, uh, these two prophets have already experienced the suffering and the death and the iniquity and the and the darkness that's in the hearts of men and been victimized by it as their body lays on the street. So then um, what the world is able to see Right. They're able to see the transition of them being called up and then then ascending up to heaven in a cloud. They're able to see that resurrection in a slow motion type of process and behold it. Right. Um, there again, it says, and they ascended up to heaven in the cloud and their enemies beheld them. Right there. So they uh, are the people that were responsible for their death of the whole world, actively seeking them to die and actually rejoice over their dead bodies. Right. Um, when they feared, as we said, these were their enemies. They weren't fearful uh, because they now had a reverence for God. They were fearful because they were scared. It was like, oh, my goodness, more torment and more torture. But they're still considered their enemies. Enemies meaning that they actively opposed them. They were 
hostile to the will of God, hostile to the prophets, right? Hostile to enough that they were desiring to hurt and to kill them because they were the people of God. So they were still their enemies. And if they could have killed them and gone back to them uh, and, and, and killed them again, they would have done that. So the Lord just called them up. And as they were ascending up in the cloud, their enemies were still looking at them, desiring them uh, to be hurt, desiring them to be dead, to be destroyed. Even after God has raised them up, they're still looking at them, still hating them, still desiring to, uh, to kill them, to harm them, to destroy them. That's how much uh, hatred is in these individuals at the during the great tribulation period, the hearts of men. But when I use that phrase that their enemies beheld them, that phrase beheld or behold is a phrase that's used when it's something that that when they're what they're looking at is something that is amazing, that is a that is a breath holding experience, something that is a glorious sight to behold. That's why I'm saying is like uh, that's like. I'm saying like that, how it says that they were called up and they ascended up to heaven in the cloud. It's like a resurrection experience. Um, and I mean, like as if their bodies were changed from like the incorruptible, right, to uh, from a corruptible to an incorruptible, like how the church is, like resurrection type. Because whatever they saw is like they beheld them as if not just getting up and just vanishing and going away, but like the, whatever they saw was like, oh my goodness, like breathtaking. It's like, you know, these these prophets stand up on their feet and then they're changed and they're glorified and and then the glory of God is upon them and around them and they ascend up into heaven, right? Unto the voice that called them, right? Come up hither. And that's what I mean. That's why I think when it says their enemies beheld them, what they're beholding is something that is amazing, breathtaking, a glorious sight. And I believe that is... Uh, the, the appearance of the resurrection uh, and the changing of them, right, to be received up and have fellowship with God um, and, and our new spiritual bodies, as well as with the rest of the saints that also have been uh, taken up as well and now have on a glory, the glorious body uh, that is worthy of heaven, that fellowship up in heaven. Verse 13, he says, in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men 7,000, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. I haven't gotten a chance to go back to show you the difference in why it says God of earth and God of heaven uh, for these different things, but but I will because uh, they have great significance and importance. And uh, eventually we're, we're, I'm going to touch on that and go back to these scriptures and show you uh, God of heaven versus God of, God of earth, right? Um, but not... Not now. All right. So the same hour, <laughs> the same hour means basically occurred at the same time as the re as the resurrection of the two witnesses. So when they begin to rise up and ascend, boom, at that same time in the Bible, the hour is the smallest unit of time available. Right. You know, the, you know, we have minutes and seconds, but in the Bible, the hour is that smallest, smallest unit. So uh, within the same time of a, within an hour or at the same time, yeah. basically, that the that the two prophets are rising and standing on their feet, uh, and they've been called and ascending up to heaven in the cloud. Uh, during that same time, there was this great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell. Right. So, them saying at the same hour that the prophets are rising up, that this earthquake occurs, indicates the correlation between the killing of the two prophets. Right. Bring a complete fulfillment to the end of the work of salvation and the beginning of the full wrath and judgment of God in Christ. So that's what the end. And so by them killing those two prophets, it's like, OK, you have that that's completed the the work of salvation, the end of salvation. And now the beginning of the full wrath and judgment of God in Christ. Right. And because earthquakes are always associated with. Right. We know earthquake means a shaking. Right. But it always precedes great wrath. That's why I'm saying that at the same time that they kill those prophets. I was like, mm, that was that was that mark an end. And then they're rising up. That's like, OK, that's the end of that. Right? He's taking his prophets off the earth. Prophets represents uh, God trying to reach out to man. That's God speaking to man through his prophets. Right. So it's like I can't do that anymore. I, you know, my prophets, my chosen prophets that I chose for myself to come down here, two, two witnesses of mine that I know that they know how to walk on this earth perfect without flaw and in the power of God, right? These two have been killed and lay their body, lay in the street. And God is like, well, I, they, they, these are my, I mean, of course, Jesus Christ, that's the ultimate messenger, right? The ultimate prophet, but he's like, 
you know, uh, I've sent I've sent two more down there, right? Um, and you've killed them. Well, that's that's the end of that. That's the end of salvation. That's the end of the teaching and preaching, you know. Uh, but they their their death marks that. Okay, well then that's the beginning now of the full wrath of God and the judgment of Christ. And we know that because it's associated with the earthquake. And earthquakes is a shakening, right? So now that means that okay, a shakening is getting ready to happen. Another great shakening, right? And earthquakes always precede great wrath. So when you look at Revelation chapter six, verse twelve, this gives you an example of how earthquakes precedes uh, great wrath or judgment. Revelation chapter eleven, verse verse twelve talks about, and I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and it goes on and on and on and on and on and on. But here you see this this correlation of the great earthquake and what follows judgments. Right, judgments falling, and the and judgment that was associated with the sixth seal opening was, was you know affected uh, the sun and the moon and other things like that. Right, uh, you go down to continue from uh, Revelation chapter six verse seventeen. It says, "For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand?" So, great earthquakes are associated with uh, wrath. The wrath is coming. It, it's a proclamation that wrath is coming. That's why when Jesus was talking about uh, the signs that are going to be happening, he talks about there's going to be earthquakes and there's going to be, and they're going to continue to increase and signs in the heavens and signs in the earth. Well, every time that there's increasing earthquakes, it's a sign of more judgments to come. Those judgments that, that so he talks about there's going to be earthquakes and then he talks there's going to be signs in the, in the moon, uh, in the stars and the, whatever, causing men's hearts to fail them. Every time there's an earthquake, that's a sign of more and more judgments that are coming. So there's going to be more and more earthquakes. There's going to be more and more signs in the heavens, more and more signs in the earth, more and more uh, death and destruction. And so uh, when you go back and you map out all the earthquakes that are going on across the world, you know that they are increasing. That means that it's a sign of more judgment and more wrath of God is coming. So we don't want to see more earthquakes, but we know it's a fulfillment. Uh, I, I, it's, we're reaching the point of the end of salvation and the beginning stage of God's wrath and judgment, right? So just remember all these earthquakes that keep coming, we know this, that the earthquakes are a sign of the judgment and wrath of God to come, but the more and more that they come, it just means that the more and more of God's wrath is being poured out every time. So, you know, there may have been an earthquake over in Nevada and then there's a rare earthquake in Tennessee. These are proclamations of judgments that are about to come to those regions and to those areas. Right. So every and then the more and more they come, then they become in Jamaica where there's a judgment coming in Jamaica where God is saying, mm, I'm seeing what's going on. I'm bringing judgment um, and wrath to that area, to that nation. Right. OK. And then it may come in the form of a hurricane, a tidal wave or a tsunami or, you know, some kind of plague or something like that. But these earthquakes precede those those that wrath and judgment. Right, but many don't see it, many overlook it, many discount it, but those those what those things represent. Um, we read this before in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 26 through 29, uh, the scripture talking about, Paul talking about that um, uh, he once shook the earth, but he's going to shake it again to move, remove all those things that can be shaken. So when the earthquakes come, if they are shaken, then they're going to be removed to only those things that cannot be shaken. And those things that cannot be shaken, those things that are in the Father and that in the Son, those things are permanent and they shall never be removed. All right, so continue on. So earthquakes represent uh, the beginning of the judgment and the return of all things to Christ. All right, so it says there was a great earthquake. And it says, and the 10th part of the city fell. So, you know, basically we're, we're doing now, I didn't, wasn't doing this when we first started the book of Revelation, but now I'm getting more into more word study. Before I was more de dealing with general concepts and topics um but now for some reason we've changed and i'm starting to do more of like more specific word studies which i want to need to go back uh in the early chapters of revelation because i wasn't doing word study which were more general concepts to get you to, and see the the theme of what's going on but not specifically word studies so i means i have to go back again next time we go through and do like i'm doing now more word study to pick out more specific details but it says that there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell the 10th part right, represents a tithe, right? We know this, right? We know you go back and you get the word 10th. It's associated with a tithe that is given to God. So when this talks about the 10th part of the city fell, it is a 10th part of what is due to God, 
right? It's a tenth, but this tenth part of what's due to him is the judgment that is due to him, that God is due to give his judgment. And he takes the tenth part of it right now. He says, I'm going to take my part of my judgment right now, right? But um, it represents judgment. It rep This tenth part represents his judgment that is coming. It represents the possession that he's going to uh, uh, take, and it represents uh, the worship that is going to be given to him as a result of his proclamation of his fulfillment of his, his judgment and his taking what is his, right? There's a worship that's going to come out of it. The body of Christ is going to worship. Those that are under the altar saying, oh, oh Lord, how long before you take vengeance, right? And, you know, of the, all the great apostles and the prophets of Old and New Testament have always been saying, Lord, you know, please, you know, uh, clean things up. You know, David wrote all oh, lots of things like, Lord, you know, wipe the iniquities, iniquities from the earth, you know, the transgressors, whatever, you know, um, right? As a result of the Lord fulfilling or God fulfilling his judgment and his justice, there's a worship that's going to come out of that. And so here we're going to see that when this earthquake, great earthquake happens, right? Uh, it's a fulfillment of judgment and God's great wrath. And he begins with taking the 10th part of it, right? So the 10th part. The other thing is that, well, then what about the rest of it? Well, the rest of it we're going to talk about really um, goes to uh, goes to Christ and to the saints. Right? But anyway, I don't want to get, get too ahead of myself and explain, explain it here. That's why I put my little notes here so I don't um, get, get too far gone. So the 10th represents a tithe that is taken and given to God, right? So the city fell. That city is actually that great city, which is actually Babylon, Sodom, and Egypt, right? So when the city falls, God is executing his judgment upon it. He takes the tenth of it to himself, right? So what, what about the rest? The rest of that city is going to go to Christ. Christ is going to take it. He's going to, well, and then Christ is going to share it with the bride and, and, uh, and the saints, uh, the two prophets and all the rest of those that get captured up, uh, that are raptured up or or resurrected up during the great tribulation period, right? That he's that's the rest of it's going to go to Christ, but ten of it, ten percent of it goes to God, right? Um, and then the rest is going to go to Christ, and then Christ is going to share it with the body, with the bride, uh, with all the saints, Old and New Testament. Those during the tribulation period, he's going to Christ is going to share that with it, but ten percent has to go to God. So the 10% that goes to God that he takes, right, is the 7,000 men slain, right? The 10% that he takes, God takes, is the 10th of the city, right? That's what he takes. So um, let's look at the 7,000, right? Now, these things represent symbolism, right? Not that there's not 7,000 men slain, but the Bible says that the, the book of Revelation is put into signs and symbols, and these signs and symbols, symbols give us um, a symbolic understanding of what is what's happening here. But it says here that uh, the tenth part of the city fell, and the same hour in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. Right. So this seven thousand men that were slain represents the unsaved mankind that were judged. Right. So they were judged. This is a judging. So this great judgment or great wrath that's being poured out. Right. The Lord takes his he takes 10 percent of that judgment for himself or that's what's offered up to God. The rest of it, Christ is going to take care of the rest of it himself. When he comes down, uh, the Bible says the sword is going to come out of his mouth and he's going to slay so much that the blood is going to be up to the horse's bridle. And it's going to run for um, tens of tens of hundreds of miles or whatever like that. Right. So the rest of it, the Lord's going to take care of. God's going to give it to Christ to kind of execute that. But God gets his portion, his tenth. Right. And his 10th is just his 10th of the city and 7,000 men slain. You know, God is like, I'll, I'll take that, <laughs> you know, and Jesus takes the rest along with the saints. So we participate in the rest of that um, uh, wrath or judgment because we come with Christ as well um, on horses with Christ. How do we come on horses? Anyway, but we come with him as, as, as a cloud falling, fall, following with him. Right. And with Christ, when he executes judgment, he destroys and kills all those people and stuff like that. <laughs> Right, so the 7,000 men represent unsaved um, men or mankind on earth that's judged, right? Because the Bible says uh, all belong to him, all souls belong to him. So the Lord, he, he claims his 7,000. So we know this 7,000 is a symbolic number. We know seven is the number of divine completion or perfection of God's purpose. So 
um, so this seven here is just talking about that. That's God's perfect, um, um, <clears throat> um, God's perfection of his purpose, that he takes the 7,000 men and he takes the 10th of the city. Uh, that's that perfect part for him as a part of his completion of his perfect divine will is now going to take place, right? Uh, seven is a symbol for salvation. Or you would say, wait a minute, but there's there's ten, there's seven thousand people being being killed. How is seven a symbol of salvation in with seven thousand men being saved, being being killed? Well, because that is the the our salvation occurs first. Our bodies are saved, right? Or we are we're saved. Our souls are saved, and then our bodies are purified and saved, so that we may offer up ourselves as a living sacrifice unto God. Uh, but then also, or when I say saved, I mean purified of iniquity and sin and, you know, darkness and all that stuff. But eventually, our, the complete work of our salvation is even the very appearance of evil and the presence of evil and iniquity have to be completely eradicated from off this earth. And of course, that happens ultimately when there's a new heaven and a new earth and the old heaven and the old earth are passed away. But so it's a process that happens. And so part of our salvation has to do with eradication of even individuals and institutions that are full of darkness and iniquity um, and uh, wickedness. And so this 7,000 men being slain is part of the complete work of salvation or the end of salvation, the end of our salvation, both Old and New Testament. It's like God is cleaning things up, destroying the iniquity, destroying the wicked men and stuff like that. So this 7,000 men is the beginning of the cleansing process that is to occur to make our salvation complete. I hope I'm, in, I'm trying to explain this, right? The, the word, the, we keep seeing the thousand a lot in the Bible. Thousand, that, for that word thousand represents a complete fullness, right? Uh, let, me, let me give, uh, give an example of complete. It's like the complete fullness of God's work um being being fulfilled so there's like a thousand year millennium reign that christ has that's the complete work of god reigning on this earth or the work of christ reigning on this earth he does it for a thousand years that means he's it's a complete full work of him showing his grace showing his love extending his bounty and mercy to the whole world right when he's here present satan being bound for a thousand years that means satan being bound is a complete uh, it means uh, a represents a complete fullness of him being bound for a thousand years to uh, completely eradicate Satan from the presence of the earth and allow the the presence of Christ to fully blossom or whatever. All right. Uh, when the scripture talks about 10,000 thousand saints or 10,000 thousand angels that were innumerable, that word thousands trying to let us know it's the complete number of God, uh, whether it be for those that are under the altar. Right. <laughs> Uh, it talks about them like being thousands and stuff like that. It's like it's the fullness of God's salvation and wrapped in and, and capturing those individuals during the great tribulation period. When it talks about uh, the body of Christ and in the beginning part of Revelation, when it talks about the church, the bride, how there were thousands of us as well. That's talking about the complete uh, the complete fullness of God's capturing out or 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 salvaging out of the world. Um, all of those that had been put in the light in Christ, like it's the, it represents the fullness, the completeness of God's work, because Christ doesn't rapture us out until the complete work of Christ is fulfilled and bringing salvation to the body of, uh, during the church age, right? And so uh, that's what the, that, that's what thousands means. I'm talking about all those an, uh, angels, ten thousand thousand of angels, just means like the fullness of of all the angels that serve God and worship him. You know, they're all involved in worshiping God and worshiping Christ when they were also singing songs and stuff like that. All right, when the scripture talks about in Psalms verse 90, verse four, it talks about every beast of the forest is mine and the cattle on a thousand hills is mine. That thousand represents, it's the complete fullness of everything that belongs that is on the earth. All of that is his. The fullness of the earth, it belongs to him. It's all his, right? That's what that thousand means. And so when it talks about 7,000 men slain, uh, it's saying that I'm beginning to begin the work of the perfect um, salvation, bringing it to an end, uh, my perfect purpose, 
and divine completion. I, that's it. This is the beginning of it. And this 7,000 that I'm taking out is the beginning of the fullness of my wrath, the fullness of my judgment. And I'm taking my 10% and the rest of now is about to occur. Right. I, I hope that kind of kind of makes sense. I've kind of killed that 10th part. Right. So again, you know, the the 10th part is what is due to God, both in judgment and in possession and in worship. I'll explain what I mean by uh, and in worship. Right. Um, the tithe represents the spoils that is taken and given to God. So this 10th is the spoils. Right. The spoils. And <laughs> of the city is taken a tenth of that is given to God, the spoils of the of wicked transgressors, right? Hearts, the evil hearts of wicked men, right? He takes his, his spoils, a tenth of that, that 7,000 represents symbolically a tenth of that. And it's the perfect number, right? Uh, that completes his, uh, his purpose, right? As part of this judgment, right? And we said before, the rest of the spoils are shared um, and given by Christ with the bride and, and the saints. And we talk about that um how christ is going to come down with with the saints and how we're going to rule and reign with him we're going to take over the city how christ is going to destroy with the root of his mouth he's going to just kill and slaughter but it's going to be splattered all over him as well um but this was always prophesied jesus when he gave his his uh, sermon on the mount i didn't really go back and try to bring up too many scriptures but he always talked about how the meek shall inherit the earth and uh blessed are the poor right for what does he say blessed are the poor for they shall uh see god and i believe it's believe something like that but it just talks about how and there's other scriptures that just talk about how how the world how the earth is going to be given back to the to, to the saints right um so it is ours right god takes his tenth part right and then he's going to give the rest to christ and christ is going to share it to us and christ has already told us that he's going to share uh the earth is going to be ours to reign and to rule over both this current one here and then of course in the new heaven and the new earth that is to come all right that's going to be shared uh with us in christ but this is the first of that possession that god takes his tenth part and the rest is going to be given to us genesis chapter 14 verse 18 through 20 talks about this tenth here um uh, we all know know the account that when abraham went and rescued lot and his family from a war that took place between two warring uh, kings, Abraham rose up and he delivered Lot and he kind of gathered back all his possessions and things like that. Um, and then he was met on his way back, he was met by uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And we know that how Abraham gave a tenth. So here's, we see the same concept here. In Genesis chapter 14, verse 18 through 20 talks about uh, beginning and says, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed him. Speaking of Abraham, he he king um, uh, Melchizedek, king of Salem, the high high priest of God, blessed Abraham. In verse nineteen, and said, "Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth." All right, so Abraham was blessed of the Most High God, is what he's saying, and God is possessor of both heaven and earth. This is what the proclamation that Mel, King Melchizedek was saying, uh, that Abraham was blessed of the Most High God, right? And verse 20 says, And blessed be the Most High God, which have delivered thine enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. So Abraham ended up giving um, King Melchizedek 10% of all the things that he had gathered up as spoils when he went back and defeated uh, those kings that had ended up capturing Lot. So the rest of the spoils, though, Abraham kept, right? But he gave 10% of that to uh, to uh, Melchizedek, the king of Salem, the most uh, high priest of God, right? So here we see that same principle going on here is that judgment and spoils are being, a tenth of it is being given to God. And Abraham keeps the rest. But in this example here in the book of Revelation, Christ is going to keep the remaining 90 percent. And he's going to share that with 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 uh, with the bride of Christ and with the saints. Right. We know that's what this talking about, because I'm going to skip down here a little bit, because in Revelation chapter 5, chapter 11, verse 15, it says the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. So when this great earthquake is poured out. Right. That means judgment and wrath. The wrath of God is coming. 
uh, the tenth part of the city is taken, is fallen, and seven thousand men are slain. All right, all of this is the ten percent. And then the remaining part is what's going to take place when we get down to Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The remaining part of the kingdoms of this world um, are, are taken by God and taken by Christ, but it's all going to eventually just be given to Christ. And that's what we see here in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord. Of our Lord here is talking about God and of his Christ. We know that's the son of God and he shall reign forever and ever. And this is just talking about God takes his 10%. Right. And he gives the rest of it to Christ. Christ reigns and rules over, over the remaining part of it, along with with the bite of Christ. Right. And uh, the saints. All right. It says in the same hour, there was a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were slain 7000 men and the remnant were affrighted and gave gave glory to the God of heaven. So now we're now we're we've. Uh, we we've covered the hour, the great earthquake, the 10th part of the city. Uh, the 7,000 men were slain. So now we're dealing with the remnant. Now, what is this remnant that they're talking about? It says the remnant were affrighted, right? The, the phrase remnant is not talking about the remaining people that were in the city that were not slain. It's not talking about 7,000 men were slain. Those others that were not slain, that's the remnant. That's not the remnant that it's talking about. This remnant here is talking about the saints, the believers that were in Jerusalem or that are in Israel that are or, or or wherever their believers are at right they're the remnant that when they saw the judgment that was proclaimed and the 10th part of the city fell and the 7000 were slain those that were believers right they were frightened and they gave glory to god right the the uh, the people that are Sodom the Babylon that's living there Right, they're never going to give glory to God at them. They're never going to do that. They're never going to have the fear of the Lord. Right, they they are the enemies of God. They killed the prophets. So this remnant here, when they see, right, the scripture says here, except the Lord had left us a remnant. Right, the remnant is the holy city, the true Israel. Right, they said none of us will survive or whatever. Right, All right. So. Um, these are the believe. This remnant here are the believers that don't receive the wrath of God, right? And because they don't receive the wrath of God, man, they are just like, oh my God, they have a fear of God. They're like, man, you know, we're serving God. We are not uh, subject to the Israelites that give their life to Christ at the preaching of the prophets that cause them to turn back to the Messiah. The remnant that gets captured away and hid in the, uh, eventually hid and protected in the earth. Right during the the Antichrist uh, killing spree and all the judgments that are being poured out, right? The, that remaining remnant that's there, they don't face these judgments that are coming upon the earth that God is pouring his wrath out upon Babylon. The remnant don't face that. They don't experience that. But they see what's going on and they have a great fear of God. They have a reverence for him, right? Uh, and they give glory to God of, of heaven. All right, so those believers that don't receive the wrath of God, that's that remnant, that's the Israel, the true Israel, the holy city that is mentioned in, in Revelation, the early parts of Revelation, uh, chapter 11, right? Uh, I'll just, I'll give you another example of how remnants are talking about uh, the Israel's, Israelites that have given their life to Christ, to the Messiah and stuff like that, and believing that, and waiting, uh, that are praying and, and mourning and sacri and, and, um, uh, and, praying for the Lord's return and praying for forgiveness and things like that. Uh, I'll show you that that's what that remnant is talking about. When you look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, it says, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So the remnant here, uh, I know I'm, I'm pulling on the scriptures because we've read, we've read through this so we know the content. So that's why I'm able, I'm jumping around a little more. I didn't do that the first time we went through and just looked at just the what's there, what's all the actors, right? What's kind of generally going on now? We're, I'm jumping around because we know that we we know Revelation. So here, the, when it's talking about the remnant in verse eleven, in chapter eleven, verse thirteen, here that remnant is talking about uh, the Israelites because primarily during this time God has turned to Israel. At this point, the only ones remaining, pretty much, right? Um, that remnant represents the uh, Israel that has is turned back back to God. And this remnant is very specific in talking about the character of the remnant, so who this remnant is. They're the ones that keep the commandments of God. 
So they obey God. They obey his word. They hear his voice, right? But in addition to that, we know that now Israel has turned to Christ because it says they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So these are the individuals that the prophets have gone out and uh, those two prophets have gone out and turned Israel back to their fathers, which is the father and the son of Jesus Christ. They've turned them back to their fathers that have nurtured them and cared for them and made them a nation, right? That's the remnant that we're talking about. That's why they were frightened. That's why they gave glory to God because they are the ones that, the remnant that keeps the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, right? So um, this word affrighted means um, they were afraid or they feared or they trembled at the judgment of God. That's what this word affrighted mean, right? So this is not talking about uh, the wicked Babylonian, Babylon, um, that Sodom and Egypt that's worshiping Satan, where that they weren't affrighted, right? But the remnant were affrighted. That's why these, these are kind of grouped together, right? So to be affrighted, is the response of true believers, right? That's the, re to be affrighted is a response of those that truly, that love God, keep his commandment, have the testimony of Christ. When the judgments are poured out, when we see judgments being poured out and uh, hurricanes coming through, great earthquakes coming through, plagues coming through, um, uh, her, you know, all these things, right? Those that, that love God, that keep his commandment, keep the testimony of Jesus Christ, we are affrighted. That's, that's our response when we see the judgment of God coming out, that we are affrighted. We, we tremble at the judgment of God. One, knowing that, oh, thank God that we believe in Jesus Christ, so we're able to escape these things, and these things are not coming upon us, but, right, but we know that God is true and his, his wrath is great. Right. And nobody can stay. Who can who can be able to stand? Right. When the wrath of God is poured out. Right. And we're like, no, we won't be able to stand. God, if your wrath is poured upon us, your judgment poured upon us, we wouldn't be able to stand. We can't overcome. Right. Your wrath is poured upon us. And so we are frightened. We are fear. We are tremble. We are humbled before the presence, the, uh, the presence of God. Right. Uh, that the response to that, of course, we said, who shall be able to stand, of course. And the following chapters begins with one hundred forty four thousand being filled with the Holy Spirit. Those are the only ones that are able to stand in the presence of God's judgment and wrath. Those that have been received the testimony of Christ and have been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. They are the only ones who are able to stand. So these this remnant here is a frightened. Right. Um, and give glory to God because that's the proper response to those that keep the testimony of God, that keep his commandments, that love him. They they fear and they tremble at the judgment of God, knowing that we wouldn't be able to stand. The only way we're able to stand is because we have been found in the mercy and the love of God and we have the testimony of Christ. If not, we wouldn't be able to stand. We'd be destroyed just like the, the transgressors are being destroyed. All right, so... Um, it's a, I have a phrase here. It's a soul saving, godly, righteous thing to have the fear of God, right? If you have the fear of God, uh, it's a righteous thing to have that. It's a soul saving thing. That means that you have the testimony of God. You keep his commandments. It's the sign of that. People that when these judgments are being poured out, they don't move. They're not moved by it. They shake it off like, oh, I don't believe that. Oh, that's nothing, whatever. <laughs> that's a bad thing to have, right? But it's a good thing to have. Right. When you see judgments being poured out, being like, oh, Lord, Jesus is coming. <laughs> you know, the wrath of God, the day of judgment is coming. Christ is soon to come. Y'all get ready. People that have that mindset. Yes. All right. You are you are those that have the that that obey the camp, keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Christ that fear God, that are frightened at these things and don't want to be left here or in the position of being uh, having the judgments of God and the wrath of God put upon you. Right. And so have to have, have to have the fear of God. Right. Is a godly, righteous, soul saving thing to have. When you don't have that anymore, then you're in trouble. You're in trouble. And you don't even know you're in trouble. You know. Right. And it says, and it gave glory to the God of heaven. So that's the response of true believers um, at the sight of God's judgment. That's that's that is the response that you believe when they see these things pouring out, they give glory to the God of heaven. We're like, thank you, Jesus, for sparing us. Thank you for having mercy on us. Uh, thank you that we've been found in you and you have not poured out your wrath upon us. Right now, when I was talking about that, the 10th part of the, the, the tithe or the 10th part that happens when God pours out his wrath and judgment is both. What did I say here? Is both. The tenth part of what is due to God is both judgment, possession, and worship. 
right? The judgment that we've seen, the earthquake comes, the 10th part of the city fall, right? Uh, the a possession occurs, the possession we talked about, the kings of this world become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. That's the possession. When judgment comes, God takes what's his. He, he takes it, he destroys it, or he takes what's his. It's like, I'm taking what's mine, or I'm, and I'm destroying what's mine, right? Right. But also I said it also, the 10th part also includes worship, right? And that's what we're seeing here in this phrase, right? And all this together is talking about great earthquake, 10th part of the city fell, right? Slain 7,000 men and the remnant were frightened and, gave, and gave, gave glory to the God of heaven. That's judgment, possession, and worship. All those occur simultaneously when God pours out his wrath. The body, Those that are believers of God and believers in Christ and hold the commandments of God and keep the testimony of Christ, we worship at the sight of God's judgment. Right. That and and God receives glory in, into that. So part of that tenth is is worship. Worship is a part of that tenth that God receives when He pours out His wrath. The the uh, the saints are glad to see righteousness. They're glad to see the iniquitors of the earth, the great transgressors, um, purged and cleansed. The the justice and judgment of God. You know, for all their murders and their violence and the uh, thefts, the scripture says, and their fornication and their idolatry and their darkness and their sodomy in Egypt, right? We're glad to see that de that destroyed. We're glad to see the works of iniquity destroyed. We're glad to see politicians and uh, crooked cops or teachers or bosses. We're glad to see them removed off the scene. Right? We worship God at the sight of that. Right? We glorify God. So that's part of the tenth that he's receiving unto himself. Right? The rest of that praise and the worship, that, the rest of that uh, possession and judgment and worship, it goes to, it goes to Christ. Christ is going to receive the remainder of that. And God has allowed that to go toward his son. Right? And we worship, the saints, we worship Christ for that. Uh, for when he comes down and he reclaims and cleans up and destroys the enemies and purges her, you know, Christ receives the worship for that as he receives both judgment and possession as well that, that he acclaims, takes to himself. All right. Um, all right. What's my time here? Where am I at here? Oh, all right, guys. I went right up to... Um, all right, I'll just read this last part here and then I'll kind of wrap up verse this part here. Um, so giving glory to God, giving glory to the God of heaven, that's the response of the true believers at the sight of God's judgment. So that's part of the 10th that he receives. So this 10th part that he's talking about that he receives, all of this is the 10th part, the fall of the city, right? The 7,000 slain uh, and the glory given to him by the remnant. That's all the 10th that he receives. That's what that 10th is talking about. A grouping all of that it just continues, comma, you know, and then semicolon, all of that is his tenth, right? Not just the city. But yeah, the tenth of the city did fall, but he, the tenth part is the 7,000 men as well. And he receives uh, the, the, the remnant represents, their glory represents the tenth. The whole body of, of Christ and all the saints old from the Old New Testament, that's that other like 90%, right? Uh, but he received just a little bit of the tenth right now represented by the remnant, right? Um, now, I'll, I'll read Revelation chapter 12, verse 7, um, that what God wants to receive, he wants to receive worship. He wants to receive glory, right? And every time judgment comes forth, it allows him to receive, um, uh, when his wrath comes forth, uh, he receives, and when judgment comes forth, it automatically also, out of that comes worship. And we see that in Revelation chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. I'll read it. It says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, fear God, right? The, the, the remnant was affrighted, right? Fear God, give him glory, right? The remnant gave glory to God of heaven. For the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. So, uh, you know what what God wants is He wants He wants Him to be He God wants reverence, and He wants glory. But out of His judgment, He receives reverence, and He receives glory, and He receives worship. Right? He's going to receive that from the remnant and from the saints uh, up in up in the mezzanine, up in heaven, right now, looking down, watching all those things. Glory. 
and worship, which we're going to see as we continue. I think we're going to get to the 24 elders and stuff like that. They're going to be starting to worship as well. So when the judgment of God is poured out, he's going to receive worship. He's going to receive uh, reverence. He's going to be glorified when judgment is pouring out, right? So sometimes we look at um, judgments and we don't see how God is being glorified. He is being glorified in judgments when he's pouring out his judgment, right? That's all you want. When judgments are pouring out, the response should be, let's fear God, let's reverence him, let's give him glory, let's worship God, let's keep his commandments. If we do that, boom, I mean, the judgment stop, right? Just, just will stop. But of course, the world is not going to do that, but God's still going to receive his glory uh, from, from the saints when he pours out his judgments upon the earth. All right, I'm going to stop right there because I am well out of time, but I think we made good progress. I think we covered a couple of scriptures. Any comments or questions?